All right. We should be live. I'm going to see if I'm live. All right. I'm live. And I see we have, uh, we have a bunch of you guys already on. Um, okay. Uh, pretty quick here. Uh, Echo is going to be, be joining us. Hang on, guys. Bear with me, guys. <laughs> You guys are just piling in there, aren't you? Give me just a second there, guys. I'm not trying to ignore you. I'm trying to I'm trying to see if I can get echo on here. I don't see him on here. We've got to have Echo. Is, is Echo going to be here? Hang on. I'm going to do roll call pretty quick. All right. So I just uh, I emailed Echo the link a few minutes ago, so he's not responding on the phone. Hopefully he is coming on. So we have a, a pretty good live stream. It's going to be a great live stream. I was going to have Walter on, but he chose to be with his girlfriend, which I don't blame him. I mean, if I had to be on a show with a bunch of guys or out on a date with my girlfriend, be the girlfriend, right? So uh, Walter, he might drop in though and say hi. We told him, hey, if you're Get the chance, drop in, say hi. We'd love to see you. Just tell you hello. So, uh, so uh, Walter may be here. Echo, hopefully, he's going to be on soon. So, for this live stream, what we're going to do is uh, uh, this has been a, a, a different live stream. It's, it's a live stream series. What we're doing is we're taking these 223 Remington cases and we're going to run them all the way through processing the cartridge case until we get the Bob's bullets loaded up. And, and I'm going to use my tack recipe. I'm going to use this 55 grain uh, bullet. And what our goal is, is it's spring. The squirrels are running, man. The squirrels are running. Uh, we call them uh, whistle pigs, man. They're out in the desert. And so it's time to go shoot. But I'm going to tell you this. That's true. There's nothing worse than going out trying to shoot your reloads and they won't chamber. They won't function. So the whole point to these live streams is uh, follow along because we're going to load in extreme detail to where when you go out and you're shooting your AR-15, it's going to chamber every time. It's going to cycle every time. And these uh, live streams for the 223 Remington for the AR-15, I'm always going to have these because that's what the guys want, right? That's like the number one biggest, most requested thing. So, um, okay. So, uh It's a guy. No, it's his girlfriend. It's his girlfriend. No, Walter doesn't have guy friends, okay? Walter's got a girlfriend. Actually, I got to tell you guys this. Walter's always got a girlfriend. He is. He's a man of the world. He's always got a girlfriend. You know, I, highest admiration for the guy, right? He's like, he's like, a, Walter is a cross between John Wayne and Clint Eastwood. He just is. And so, yeah. Um, uh, okay, so. Big Kenny says he's building a Palmetto State kit as we speak. I want everybody, I want everybody to type Bob's bullets. I'm going to call you off, and then I'm going to show you a couple things that I've got going on, and then we're going to get into some uh, prepping some cases, okay? All right, Bob's bullets, and I'm going to call your name off. I miss you guys. I miss you guys. The reason I haven't been live streaming is I ran out of StreamYard time. 
ah, I only get 20 hours a month, but we're back at it. We're going to do some more live streams. The beautiful Miss Highboy is on. We have sleeplessness 69. Okay, I got to slow the comments down here. Hang on. Hang on. Sleepless ND69 is in the house. Long live three is in the house. The beautiful Miss Highboy. We got ND79 Z28. Yes, Bob does make projectiles. That's what he does. Six shooter Texan is in the house. Who else we have? We have 16 on. Weather's getting nice, so a lot of people will probably rather be out, you know, doing things. But if you're here, man, we're grateful. Very grateful. All right. I'm going to show you a few things I've got going on. The first thing is I'm going to take this camcorder and I'm going to take you around to the other side of the bench. And I'm going to show you my score. I was I couldn't believe this. But now, listen very carefully to me. I'm going to show you something. If you get a chance to score on one of these, Okay, let's see. Hobble hob. Gates reloading. <laughs> if you get a chance to find one of these, I would highly suggest you snatch it up. I'm about to show you something from the past they don't make anymore. That is actually better than most that are made today. So I'm going to take this camcorder around. I'm going to show you what I'm talking about. I'm going to try and do this without, uh, you know, unplugging my cord. So bear with me. See, you you learn a lot when you come to my channel. All right. I'm going to try and sneak around here. Got these boxes I got to walk around. So let's say you were at a gun show or. You were at a garage sale. You were just on eBay, and you saw one of these. You'd be like, oh, that's an old scale. Um, that's an old scale. It's no good. No, I'm not. You'd pass it. I don't know if I'd be so quick to pass up on this scale. Now, watch. Watch. Each increment here is 10 grains all the way to 500 grains and normally over here you have your tents but you also have your grains your grains and your tents but now let me show you this okay I'm just gonna show you this Look at the detail to workmanship. When you move this, you can move it very controlled and it stays. You can actually count the clicks without minimal intrusion on that beam. Same here, look. So let me tell you what this is. These are the old Pacific scales. Hornady purchased Pacific back in the day. They came in, they purchased Pacific. Well, to make this scale with that much detail, that's a lot of money. They simplified it. And the scales that you see today they are made for price point, okay? They, price point. These businesses, they have payroll to cut. You know, they have lights to keep on. So they have to cut corners. So what they did is they did away with that very fine, hardcore workmanship. They don't make this scale anymore. The interesting thing about this scale 
is you see these two adjustable nuts these scales have on the end. You can calibrate if it falls off calibration. And if you can't get it calibrated, you can send it back, I'm pretty sure, to Hornady, and they can calibrate it and send it back to you. Now, I'm not 100% on that. I'm pretty sure. Okay? So I scored on this one today. Some guy came onto the forum, wanted to sell that. I got a hold of him. I wanted it. Um, these two are matching in red. This one's a little darker. I've already got this one sold. Look how nice this is. It's just perfect. Absol actually, I don't know if it's sold. I'm not 100%. Um, I got a guy. He's thinking about it. This one, it's actually in better condition than this one. This one just has a few scratches on it. This one is mint. It's just that it's a darker red than these two, and these two are more matching. So these two I'm keeping, this one is for sale. So here's the moral of the story. Go to eBay. Check it out. If you can score on one of these that's in pretty good condition, they don't have to look good, but they got to have everything about them. And uh, make sure, here, here, here you go. If you can get a picture, what you want is you want the base pretty much even with the table, and you want it to be able to zero out. That's what you want, okay? But the, these things, they're hardcore. They're good scales, and they're very, very sensitive, very accurate scales, as you can see. Uh, I just moved this around, and I zeroed everything, and that pointer is still right where it was. And it's a heavy scale. Another thing I like about this is your foot screw is on the outside. So to adjust it, it's not here where you got to reach around everything. You just come over here with a screwdriver and adjust it, and everything's out of the way. This is a fantastic skill. I almost thought about keeping this third one, but I don't, I don't need three. Anyway, that's my score. I thought I'd share it with you. A Hornady magnetic scale. If you get a chance to get one, I would highly recommend you getting it okay now um what else do i got going well let's just kind of come over here we're waiting for echo to come on so we'll kind of come over here like this what else what else do i got going on check it out what do you guys think i'm working uh these are some 3030 winchester cases that were given to me these were all fired out of the uh, the same rifle. Those looking good. I don't know how many is here when I'm done. I'll know. And one little forty-five auto case. So that's what I got going on. Um, one thing, you know. Wherever you work, you know, if if you get to know, you know, people you work with, let them know you shoot. There might be somebody that's been shooting a 30 out six for years and they got all their cases, or maybe they got 30 30 like this and they got all their cases, and uh, uh, they'll be glad to give them to you. They just want to get rid of them, right? So tap tap resources for cases. That's huge, right? So I'm in the I'm in the process. I've I've uh, universal decapped these. I've cleaned them in the tumblers tumbler. Now I'm drying them. And then I'm going to begin sizing these. And uh, I'll have them all ready to rock and roll. That's, that's what I got rolling. Okay. All right. Here we go. Back, back to the bench. We're going to get to some uh, case prep work. Andy 79 Z28. He says, nice score on the brass. I kind of thought so. Anytime you can get brass free and something you shoot, that's a nice score. We got Jeff Calvert in the house, Sergeant Sandman, 5280 Reloader, uh, Hobble Hob. Yeah, I, it's not that I got a new mic. I just put my mic on. So I hope you guys can hear me better. Hey, by the way, my wife and I just bought these Yeti coolers, uh, tumblers. Do any of you guys have these? These are really incredible. They're great. Guy I work with bought one. 
had ice in it at the end of the day. It's the same ice, you know. So we bought them really nice. So I'm just kind of curious. Who of you guys out there has a Yeti? No, I'm not sponsored by Yeti. We bought them ourselves. And we got Critter in the house. We got Curtis Long, Vanessa Kitty. Sergeant Sandman says it sounds a lot better. Right on. That's what we want. Okay, <clears throat> so this is what we've done so far up to this point. Up to this point, we have sized these. All of these cases, these have been sized to, you guys remember? Just under a semi minimum chamber. I want you to think about this. A lot of guys, they reload their ammo, they go out to the range, and they won't chamber. They won't fit. Well, this is telling me for sure the dimensions of this cartridge case, it's going to fit. And then um, in this series, three videos previous to this, every one of these were right there pretty doggone close, within a thousandths, okay? So we universal decapped, and then we sized our cases back. After that, we trimmed our cases. We trimmed our cases using the world's finest trimmer. And this one, uh, this is for their 3030 Winchester. I have this set up for that other brass. And so uh, we trimmed them with the world's finest trimmer. So these are all trimmed. The world's finest trimmer, it trims off the datum line of the shoulder. So the better job you do with sizing your cases, the better your trim lengths will come in from case to case, which is uh, ideal for when you're crimping. So now we're ready to get into prepping the rest of our cases. But I see we got Echo on. And everyone, welcome, Echo. How are you, buddy? Pretty good. How are you doing? Hi, boy. We're doing really good. It is good to see you, my friend. Yeah, I just made a huge mess that I had to clean up real quick before jumping on. Oh, oh, you did? I had a diet soda slip out of my hand in our living room and hit the floor and made a huge mess. Uh, well, at least it was diet. Yes. Um, I used to, back in the day, work for Pepsi Cola. This was back in 84. I did actually I worked for them in high school a little bit and I started out on the line filling, you know, soda pop, uh, whatever, whether back then we still had the bottles, the old glass bottles. But then I went, worked into the route and there was nothing worse than breaking any soda pop with sugar in it, especially grape or um, orange in the springtime when the bees were out. So and you got a nice cat there. Very nice. Oh, yeah. she's, a, she's a lover. She's a That's, little sweetie. Her name is Kit Kat. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay. So what have you been doing? I, I hear you talking about bumping shoulders back. Well, I'm just updating them on what we've done with, with these cases so far in the way of prepping. And what we did in the last uh, two live streams. This is different. This is a live stream series on loading for the 223. Instead of just a regular series, it's live, but I'm breaking it up. So the first thing we did was we uh, resized and bumped them back uh, just under a Sammy Min. On the last video, we trimmed them. So now I'm ready to step through. What I'm going to do, I'm going to do the um, military crimp remover. Then I'm going to do the primer pocket uh, uniformer, and then we'll do the flash hole deburring if the case needs it. So that's where we're at. Okay. Yeah. And so you can just feel to free to jump in and uh, add, add what you want as we go. Keep us on the going north. Okay. That sound good? Yeah, sounds good. Okay. So this is one thing that I do. And, um, uh, I have these three drills 
Okay. Before you say, man, hi, boy, that's a lot of money into them drills. It's really not. We had a DeWalt sale here, and the DeWalt guys had cash in their pocket. Well, it was their cash. Each each coupon was worth 20 bucks, and they just had them stuffed in their pockets. So they had three or four of these salesmen, and I'd talk to this salesman to get 40, and this salesman to get 40. And what was amazing, when my wife would go around talking to the salesman, she'd get double. It was <laughs> crazy. So... Well, yeah, yeah, you get what I'm saying there, Echo? It's like, really? Really? Oh, well, but, I mean, that is a benefit when your wife's getting the cash. So we didn't pay a lot for these. We got a huge discount, right? So, Hi, boy. You probably left with them giving you 20 bucks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so, anyway, I have my tools all set up on my drills, okay? and you can get a drill cheap at a pawn shop. Don't pay a lot for them, but get you three drills set up like this. I'm just going to show you this. Now, this is really this is really what I do. I'll come out after work and I'll I'll get some music going or listen to my Bible and I, and I do something like this. Oh. Okay, hang on. And then on my last one. That's my flash hole deburring tool. So what I do is I trim. I trim, military crimp, uniform, and then I hit the flash hole. That case is done. What you see happening with these three drills is everything to prep in that case. And now I'm ready. I'm ready to load this. This case has been cleaned. It's been sized. Everything. So now let's talk about what's on these drills. Do you want to add anything to that uh, um, echo? I do the exact same thing. That's awesome. That's awesome. So, all right. On the last video... We talked about this, world's finest trimmer. We know what that is. We come in and we trim it, right? After we trim it, we have to chamfer and deburr. I'll put a link in the description box below. Uh, this is by Little Crow Gunworks, okay? The chamfer and deburr, they have a 30-degree bevel. What what, what uh, bevel do you have on your chamfer and deburr? I've got to believe it's 15 degrees, the Redding one I use. And I think I've got one that's 20 uh, for like VLD. For VLDs, yeah. yeah. I saw, I saw, is that an RCBS? Yeah, I believe it is. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. So basically on this precision prep tool, it's counterclockwise. I go approximately five turns or until it's smooth that that's the chamfer and deburr how's that look david that looks good looks good yeah oh yeah minimal minimal effort so now what we want to do we want to remove any military crimps on the primer pocket this one doesn't have a military crimp but this is what i do I don't sit and inspect all of these. I, I don't. I don't sit there and look. I just automatically go like this. And I hit it. It takes me half the time just to run the tool than it does to look. If I sit there looking with my old eyes, some people that are young, they can see it uh, better, right? But this is what I'll tell you about. Let me see if I can find a case. And um, what do you, what do you do for your crimped primer pockets? I use the RCBS, a military crimp remover that Walter recommended to us. And, and I, ever since what I do is I've got three drills as well. And I'll, you know, basically uh, decrimp the military primer pocket. I'll then uniform it with the Redding primer pocket uniformer. 
Mm -hmm. And then I'll hit it with the world's finest trimmer mm -hmm. and trim the, the end of it off. Uh, basically what I do is I just do the same thing you do. I don't worry about looking at the thing or taking my, uh, ballistic tools and checking to see if it's got one, because by the time I take to stick a, go get that tool out and do uh -huh. that step, I might as well just hit it with the drill real quick and just, and if it's something there, I'll feel it. Okay. I, I, I agree with that. Um, you're getting that tool. Well, let me go get mine. I have it too. Let's, let's get it out. So the viewers know what we're talking about. If I can find mine, that kind of tells you how, mine. how often I, Oh, here it is. I do think this is a, a handy tool. It, it is definitely saves you a primer powder and bullet, you know, from wasting them. This is the uh, this is the tool he's talking about. It's by Ballistic Tools. Okay, there you go. Yeah. The swage gauge. Basically, this tells you if your primer pocket is is worn out. One side, if it doesn't fit, it's tight. Okay, this size that. That side that fits in the primer pocket, you're going to see that uh, this tool has a, a very sharp, profound shoulder. That shoulder, it wants to be somewhere even with the head of the case. That means primer pocket depth is good. But if this side, the side with the rounded, see how it's kind of rounded? If that fits in the primer pocket, then that means it's no good. Your primers are going to pop out on you. I'll tell you why I don't use this a lot, and then I want to see what David says. I kind of can tell when my cases are done. Your primer pockets, in my, from my experience, they expand from two reasons. One, excessive pressures which I don't load in excessive pressures for my trigger time. I don't. If I was, those cases would be segregated, and then I would be utilizing this. But the other thing, it seems like about the time the, my rims get chewed up and I'm ready to toss them, it's like at that point I really don't see that I have a primer pocket issue because I don't load hot. So what do you say about that? I've noticed I, I, I like to sometimes push my 223s, even mm -hmm. my target ammo. I'll yeah. load it a little bit, you know, because I, I like Bargit and compressed loads with Bargit and 223 seem to give you pretty decent accuracy. And when I notice my prime, when I start to load a batch of brass again for the second or third time, sometimes the fourth time, um, and that's once fired as well. You know, you buy the ammunition, you shoot it, then you reload it. Um, I notice about the time my primer <coughs> pocket, when I go to seat a primer and it's starting to feel just like mush, yeah. like a, no resistance, that the actual cases, the rims are usually bent. Like if you uh -huh. stand yeah. at case uh -huh. on a piece of glass small piece of glass and look at it you'll notice it's leaning like the leaning tower of pisa because exactly you've already worn the brass head out and yes. now the pocket's going out about the same time and that's that's what i've that's exactly uh what what i i get off my brass about the time I, that's why i really keep these in batches um say four or five loadings into them I just put them. I just send them in to recycle. They're too. They're too cheap when you buy once fired range cases to mess around with that. After four or five loadings, when they're looking bad, I don't want to sit there and load 500 rounds. That's a lot of bullet powder and primer to waste when you could have just for as cheap as they are bought a bunch of you know once fired range cases. That's my opinion. Yeah, not to mention if you blow a primer or you have a case head separation, you can damage your chamber and your bolt face. Mm -hmm. 
So, you know, for what that brass costs you, it's not worth the safety issue. It's just it, let it make me some money when I take it down to the recyclable place and, you know, trade yep. it all. In. Yep. I agree. I agree. So, all right. So on the, um, on your 556 mill your and, and I guess there's some 223 now that's coming out with crimp primer pockets. Um, that's what I'm told. Um, you get that that crimp ring. Well, you have one of two things you can do. You can swage it, but what swaging does is it just pushes that that ring back. If it's done right, it it works really good. But here's the problem I've found. Because I work with a lot of range cases, um, you can set your swage tool up to swage perfectly, but then all of a sudden, some cases won't really get a perfect swage because it's a different manufacturer. So now you get on your, your Dillon and you're going, and it seems like every sixth or seventh or every third case, the primer crunches and gets smashed into there because there was still a little bit of uh, military crimp on there. So my preference is, and Walter totally got me onto this. This is a military crimp remover. And it takes that uh, crimp and removes it, and it leaves your, uh, your primer hole in a SAMI spec condition. In other words, it doesn't over dig it out. So it just goes like this. You can see it, it cut it. You can see everything, all the brass shavings flying. And now there's no crimp on that. And all of them are done by hand. So now when I load this, it's going to be silk like a brand new case. So you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I, that, that's what I had. Uh, agree with a hundred percent. Why push some brass that's already been forced to hold the primer pocket and try to shove that back in? You end up work hardening that ring, and even if you swage it correctly, you still can have a hard spot there and it give you resistance. There's a fella that uh, reloads for all the ranges here locally. And he uses the RCBS tool as well. And he's running six Dillon 1050s and with auto trim and all that, all the fancy bells and whistles. And yeah. he says because he reloads range brass because the places that he sells his ammo to, he gives them a discount if they give him brass. So he takes all the brass and a lot of it is military he says the problem he runs into is the swager is great if you're using one head stamp and right. one and, or in one lot. He says when you're using 10 or 20 different head stamps from different years and yeah. they've got all and all these manufacturers have their own specifications within what they consider plus or minus. So he ends up getting swager stuck in the, in the cartridge case. He's uh -huh. like, it's not worth it. He's just like, it, 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 it's a pain. He's just like, it's much easier if, you know, to, if you're doing multiple head stamps just to cut it out and be done with it and never have to worry about it again. Exactly. Yeah, I, that's, I totally agree with that. So here I have four of them, the crimped primer pockets. Just like that. So the, the, these are these are ready. Now I won't I won't smash primers. The primers will seat smoothly, and because they seat smoothly, they're going to seat all the way down, roughly three to seven thousandths past flush 
like we need for our auto loading rifle. Remember, when you seat the primer for your auto loading rifle, you want to be um, at least three thousandths under that case head, no more than seven thousandths. Okay. So that's this, so when I'm running this, I'm going to trim. I'm going to come here. I'm going to remove the the crimp, and now we're going to uniform the primer pocket. You want to talk about that? Uniform yeah, the primer pockets? Yeah, basically uniforming the primer pocket, the tool is set at SAMI spec. So basically what you're doing is when you put that in the primer pocket on your case is you're knocking down any high spots and you're flattening the floor of the primer pocket where the flash hole is. And this is very important because when you do this, you'll notice it usually cuts a ring around the outside of the bottom of the uh, primer pocket. And that's taken down just a couple of spots of where it's high, usually from firing a military case that's pushing the max pressure. It will kind of push that bottom of the primer pocket up a little bit, just a tiny bit, maybe a thousandth or so. But the important thing about uniforming it is when you load a primer into your primer pocket, uh, you want to push it against the bottom of the primer pocket. You don't want to crush it, but you want to push it in there enough for the anvil to make contact with the bottom of the primer pocket uniformly. And it basically preloads that anvil uh, under like a spring type tension because it is uh, being shoved against the bottom of the cup and the actual propellant. And basically um, that helps prevent light strikes or uh, primers not going off to begin with. Okay. I'm going to, uh, let me grab my pointer and I'm going to illustrate something for the viewers. Um, if I can find my, my pointer. It's got to be here somewhere. I'm always losing my pointer. I don't know why. You playing with the cat oh. with it? I don't have a cat, but maybe if I had a cat, then I'd uh. <laughs> have a I'd have a good reason. All right, take a spent primer. This is alive, but okay. I want the viewers to notice something. We have a cup, and we have an anvil, and your anvil has three feet. One, two, three. Those three feet, they set several thousandths higher than the edge of that cup. If you look at that, you see those three feet? All right. In bet if you were to take these three feet out, inside of there, you would see some priming compound. Hang on. Keep them busy. I'm going to see if I can dissect this without um, blowing it up. Keep them busy. <laughs> okay. It's not hard to do. Uh, basically, if you can get that thing apart without catching anything on fire or having a pop. Um, the important thing about the way the anvil relates to the cup is actually how the actual – priming compound makes its ignition it, it because it has an anvil that anvil has to be set firmly against the bottom of the primer pocket and evenly and that's what the uniformer does is it uniforms that primer pocket so that primer will go down in that primer pocket and the anvil's three legs will make good contact with the base of the outer edge of that bottom of that primer pocket. And what that does is it gives you a solid thing for that cup to collapse against so that the primer compound will ignite and ignite uniformly. Uh, if you get sparse ignition on a primer, 
it can cause a hang fire. It can also cause the round not to go off at all, or it can cause an inconsistent burn of your powder, which is going to give you inconsistent velocity and inconsistent accuracy. How are you doing there? Hi, boy. Okay. I think I've got it. Okay. <clears throat> I'm gonna just I'm gonna uh, just widen my screen for now. Okay, this is your primer cup. That's the compound. That's the stuff that goes bang. Ten primers in your hand would, if they all went off, mess your hand up really bad your powder it's a smokeless propellant this make no doubt about it that is an explosive okay so we have a cup and we have that explosive what they do you see that get a good look at that Look at that. You see the three feet and you see the point? That point, when the, the primer cup, when the firing pin hits the primer cup, it smashes it against that point. Guess what's between that point and the primer cup? Your compound. Remember when you were a kid and you smashed the compound and it went bang? Well, the difference is, is these, this is an anvil. See the three feet? Those three feet have to be under what we call a tension load to operate. So what they do is there's our live primer. And that anvil, it's, it's seated in there. But what happens is when you seat the primer, those three feet, they get, you see how you can see them uh, extended out from, let's let that focus there. Hang on. I'm going to do better than that for you. Hang on. It'll focus. Okay, hang on. I'm going to get a little better lighting. Hang on. I, I, I'm not going to, I'm, I'm not going to quit. We're going to get it. There. You see those three anvil feet? They're sticking up past the edge of that cup. Well, when you seat it, those feet, they kind of go inside of that cup. All right. That's why if you don't seat the primer far enough, you get what they call light primer strikes. Okay. So now let's bring David back. How would I do? Did I do okay? Oh, Yeah. Yeah, those three feet, it, basically, it's a safety measure for the primers where they set that anvil like that. 
it's uh-huh. to keep that point of the anvil for being in contact with that. So if you dropped it, inertia wouldn't cause a detonation. Exactly. Uh, basically, when you seat the primer and you're 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 pushing it down, you you can on some uh, primer seaters, you'll actually feel that anvil cu- curl up inside the the cup. You can feel it go down, you can feel it being shoved inside. And basically you're, it's like preloading a spring. Basically you're trying to make it so that anvil is firm inside that cup so that when you strike the outer cup, it has something solid to push that primer compound against to and cause a uniform ignition. If, right. if you just seat it and you think it's flush, you may fire it and it just, instead of going off, it just seats that anvil into the cup and you get a misfire. Mm-hmm. Okay. We're going to try something. Do you see where I've got that compound? That's the compound that was in the primer. Oh, I just dropped it. Hang on. That's the compound that was in that primer. Hang on, let me. Right there. It's right there. You see that? Now watch. Let's see if I can get it to go off. Nope. (laughs) So why don't you think that went off? You may have cracked it when you were removing it. Yeah. Or you may not have a firm enough. Were you hitting that on an anvil like a, a vice? Yeah. 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 I would say that you uh, cracked the priming compound. Uh huh. It went to powder, huh? Yeah. Uh-huh. It's got to stay as a hole for the uh, compression to cause the explosion. Yeah. That's interesting. That's very interesting. Okay. So, so now what we know is where that primer cup sits. Now, a lot of guys don't think about this. The primer cup, it only rides on that inside edge. It doesn't touch the entire bottom of that primer pocket, just that edge, okay? So what we do is this is your primer pocket uniformer. You can see a little bit of the the shavings coming off that primer pocket. Okay. So, this is how this works. And uh, you can use gloves if you want. Give you guys a better view. So now what this is going to do, all of these are going to be the same. So now when we seat our primers, they're going to be much more uniform. And another thing, um, this cutter, this part of the tool, hang on, this part of the tool, it butts up against the head. So this cutting shaft, it only goes so deep, and that is, uh, that's machined to a, uh, a, a SAMI specification 
on your primer pocket. So now you're uniform. Everything's uniform on this. You only have to do this one time. You don't do this every time you fire these. And to be honest with you, I'm going way too long. How long do you go, David, when you do this? Just a couple seconds, like a one yeah. one thousand, two one thousand done. And yeah. if you look, if you look at the brass pocket, the primer pocket, you'll notice in the very bottom along the outer edge there is a line of smooth polished brass and yeah. that's where those uh anvil feet will sit down into and once once that is uniformed like that you're going to get uniform pressure put on the compound yeah Now, uh, just so the viewers know, on all my brass, up to this point, everything that you see me do, that's what I do. Uh, so, naturally, I would, I would uh, resize, trim, military crimp remover, and then primer pocket uniformer. And the reason the primer pocket uniformer is important is especially on your uh, progressive machine, every one of them primers is going to seat absolutely perfect. Okay. Now, the next step I'm going to show you, I really don't do. This is something I would do if I was going to be doing more, um, you know, long distance, more precision shooting. But it's, if you want to do it, you can. On your brass, uh, with Starline brass, you don't have to worry about this. But on the inside of that primer flash hole, that little hole right there, there's a burr on the inside. So what happens is, is here's the burr, and there's powder. You got powder, right? Well, when the flash comes through, the powder behind it here, it doesn't ignite at the same time. So what we do, now watch this. See my tool? See the resistance? Okay. I got a little too much that time. Watch. Right there. All I'm doing is knocking those burrs off. Now, like I say, for my for my 223, my high volume stuff, I, I don't do this because I found that my accuracy for just shooting steel targets, and I will tell you this, even ground squirrels out to 100 yards, um, I'm still pretty deadly. Uh, so it's up to you. It, if you do, you're not incorrect, and if you don't, you're not incorrect. You oh, you need my driver's license? <laughs> huh? Oh, well, here you go, sweetheart. That's my whole wallet. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Just give your wife your whole wallet when she asks for your driver's license. So um, so there we go. So now these cases, uh, I'm not going to do all these with that because I just don't. So it's high volume. There's some things that drive me nuts, and that's one. Uh, and again, the precision shooting, and I want to go out six – 100 yards with Mayor 15, then I would do this, but that's not going to be high volume. Uh, what do you say to that, uh, David? Oh, I agree. Um, if you're using range brass or once fired brass and you're just plinking, or you're even if you're target shooting out to a couple hundred yards, there's no real need for that. That's basically that tool. What it does is when certain manufacturers manufacture their brass, they at the last point, they'll drill the hole or they'll punch the hole for the primer pocket flash hole. And when they sh shove that, uh, it's like a sharp pin through it. It will push whatever it's cut over to one side. And it looks almost like a semi smokestack 
uh, when it's wide open. You know, the the little the the rain trap on the top of the smokestack when it's when the guy's standing standing on the gas pedal, it opens up to one side, and it's mm-hmm. basically the same thing with the inside of there. Uh, Starline, the way they do their brass, they have no uh, flap of material. Other manufacturers do. Uh, Basically, when he uses that tool to remove that flap, it actually puts a small pockmark on the inside of that flash hole. And basically, so when the uh, the uh, primer ignites and it spits its flame into the k- cartridge casing, it is able to do it at a 360 degree interval. It can completely flash a 360 degree uh, symmetrical out of, you know, circle through that circle. And it gives you uh constant burn rates that are consistent from shell from cartridge to cartridge and will keep your uh velocities closer together but if you're firing out to three four hundred yards you really don't need that kind of precision and you're asking a lot of mismatch head stamps even with doing that process it's just kind of a i i totally agree with that Okay, so now I'm going to um, tell you guys this. Um, well, what I do after, after, okay, so I have done these cases now. Everything to these have been done. Resize, trim, military crimp remover on the primer pocket, primer pocket uniformer. Uh, we didn't care about the flash hole deeper. So now... If we did our job right, these are done. And this is what I do. And it, it doesn't matter how many cases I did. I run every single one of them right into that. And I make sure they fit. Okay. Now is when you want to catch that. You don't want to catch it after you've, uh, you know, put the round together. Because now you got to pull a bullet, powder, you know. Uh, but I will tell you this. If something happens, you're going through here like this. And all of a sudden, one sticks. And you're like, all right, it felt good. Then you come to here, and that one sticks. Clean your gauge. (laughs) Don't (laughs) think the case is the problem. Before you question a case at any time, Clean even if you got to clean. If you if you think, well, I just cleaned that ten rounds ago. Clean it again, because uh, a dirty case can bite you that way. A dirty case case can bite you that way. Um, so uh, there there's uh, uh, times that case case will get dirty and a case will hang up in there, and you would think it's the case and not not really. Now another thing. Sometimes you'll put a, a case into that case gauge and it won't it won't seat all the way down. But if you tap it, it will go. Go with it. If if you can just barely tap it and it will go, more than likely you had a like a bent rim and it just had to settle in there. Trust me, if your finger can tap that and it will chamber, your bolt's not gonna have any problem <laughs> popping that bad boy in there. You do you agree with that, David? Oh uh, yeah. Okay. The AR-15 is one of the most violent cycling firearms on the market. And the reason I say that is on your second and third time, you, you'll see that. And that, okay, I want you to listen to me. These are once fired range cases, but about my second and third time when I'm sizing these, some of my cases won't want to settle in because that rim's bent up, but I can get it to go. That is your indication. That's the last time you're gonna you're gonna shoot those. You're gonna shoot them. You're gonna pick them up, and you're gonna recycle them. And I can tell you that's why I've never had an issue loading these up and having my primers come out because this. Okay, some guys they say, well, 
they just they don't get this uh, case gauge. They just chamber check it in their chamber. But your chamber won't really tell you if a head is bent. This actual case gauge by L.E. Wilson, um, it's ideal because I'm telling you, you'll sit here and all of a sudden cases, you'll have to tap them in. But you know when you check them uh, like in my comparator, my, my Reading Instant Indicator, it's sized back. This is right. This is right. This is the problem. And it's starting uh, when, when it gets pulled out, the Air 15, it's starting to bend it. So at the point where, okay, that case is going to go in, but you just have to tap it, I would say that batch is done. When, when the majority of them are doing that, okay? You you can uh, share with whatever you want there, uh, David. Yeah. <clears throat> the, the, it, when the head of the case, when it starts getting bent, uh, at first, when you first notice it, you may have to tap it to go down into the uh, chamber gauge, but you don't want to reload it more than just that one time. Uh, because basically you're playing with fire and, uh, what is that? Uh, the law, uh, Murphy's law, you'll mm -hmm. go to the range and that bullet will be the second one you fire and it'll case <laughs> head separate. And now you're stuck. You can't get the case out of your chamber because the head fell off, it was blown off. And basically now you have to order a tool that's about 32 bucks just to be able to remove that case. If you don't have a wooden dowel, that's 22 caliber. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Well, there we go. That, that's for today's live stream. Uh, now how the live streams are going to go from here out for Bob's bullet is we're going, we'll be, um, we'll be priming the cases. And then what I'm going to do I'll do a live stream where we seat the bullet. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, we charge the case, seat the bullet, and crimp all in one. And this series will be over. So you can actually go through this series and follow along. But what the cool thing is, is uh, I think we'll keep, if, if you guys want, we'll keep, uh, we'll do a, like a live stream a month fully reloading 223 Remington. Every month we can do little live streams. And we'll keep it all in one place. There'll be like hundreds of videos, and all it is is just a repeat. So anyone that wants to load 223, they can follow along. Guess what? They're out shooting their own reloads. And they're shooting some pretty good reloads, in my opinion. So. Yeah, we could try some different powders as well to give oh, people kind of a heads up mm -hmm. on what yeah. seems to work well. Mm -hmm. Well, I've got so much tack. That's what I've been using, but I do want to start working a little more with Varget, I think. But Varget's kind of hard to get. So I don't want to do that until everyone can get it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, I, I, and I, I, really, I really like my tack. Another thing is I got some CFE 223. I, I got a lot of powder, so we can keep that end of it pretty interesting. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds like a good idea. Anyone got any questions? I'm going to turn this light off over my head so it doesn't blind you guys. Anyone got any questions? Um, I, I'm going to answer a question. Uh, had a guy ask me uh, how loud my Thumbler's Tumbler is. Um, well, I have, uh, I'll show you this. This is, uh, uh, op six and eight mil cases, some 30, 30. So they're all big cases. It, it's, it's loaded. It's, it's fully loaded. Okay. I'm going to turn it on. Just like that. And what I've been doing, um, do you think that's very loud, David? No. 
Um, there, I mean, you wouldn't want to put it in the same room with you and your girlfriend or wife and watch TV, but if you put it in the garage or in a, another bedroom, maybe your where your shop is and let it run, it's not going to be like something that's going to keep the neighbors up. If you have it in the garage running at night. No, uh, -uh. yeah, the, the water quiets it quite a bit moving around in there. So um, these cases, I put through my Thumbler's Tumbler. Uh, let me. I'm going to widen this screen for a moment, Dave, and I'll, I'll put you All back right. on. Give me just a moment. Uh, on these cases, those went in the Thumbler's Tumbler, just as you see it. Stainless steel pins. I put a little lemon juice and Meguiar's um, uh, wash and wax. Three hours. Three hours with stainless steel pins. The, these were uh, given to me, 3030 Winchester. They were ugly. They, they were filthy, filthy, dirty, so dirty that sometimes I don't mind sizing cases because I can wipe them down as I go. Not these. These were really bad. They look great. Once again, stainless steel pins, hot, hot water, lemon juice, not much, just a little lemon juice, and then Meguiar's wash and wax. That's all. That's all I used on those. Okay. Let me get you back here, David. Okay. okay, there you are. Yeah, that that works really well. The only thing you want to make sure you do is you don't leave cases sitting in the dirty water, because unlike a dry tumbler that you could turn it on, let it run overnight and come yeah. back the next morning, turn it off, and then come home from work and empty it. When you leave brass in the dirty solution, what happens is the carbon that broke loose from the cases will start reattaching itself. Plus, because High Boy uses citric acid, which is basically what Lemmy Shine is, Mm -hmm. And it's a water softener, but it does that by uh, making the water more acidic. Your water that comes out of your tap is basically about 7.1 to 7.4, which is just a tad alkaline. Mm -hmm. And basically by adding a small amount of lemon shine or lemon juice, that acidic acidic C or the acid in, <laughs> in that, product lowers that water's pH to around 6.5, 6.6. And anytime you leave brass sitting in an acidic solution for long periods of time, it mm -hmm. will pull the zinc right out of the brass. So you have to be mm -hmm. careful of that. So just make sure if you're going to run it for a couple hours that yep. you're around to turn it mm -hmm. off and get that brass out of that dirty water and get it cleaned out as quick as possible with fresh mm -hmm. and then into your dryer. Yeah. I always just try to uh, stay on it anyway, but, but sometimes I'll let it go all night. Like I'll turn it on. I don't care. I just go all night, but I come out <laughs> next day, pull it out. And it looks great. Right. So Yeah. And we got JH 586 in the house. All right. Hey, Jamie, so, what's going on, brother? So here's what we're going to do. We're going to call it an end to the live stream. But stay tuned because we're going to come right back with another one, and we're going to draw for the winner of the world's finest trimmer. Now, here's the deal. If you go over to the forum real quick and you go to the giveaway and you get on the world's finest trimmer and you guess the two numbers that I'm going to roll with my dice, well, you can get in. You got 10 minutes. And once I once I start that live stream, I'll close that thread and then I'm going to roll the dice. So um, and stay on it with me. Uh, well, don't go nowhere uh, there. Echo. So this is what we're going to do. I'm going to call everyone off. We're going to bring the live stream to a close and then give me about 10 minutes um, and we'll, we'll, we'll have the giveaway. So, and I'll try to keep the giveaways around say 10 to 15 minutes. That way it saves on our stream yard so we can do more live streams. Okay, here we go. Okay. 
I want everybody to type Bob's bullets. And I'm going to call you out. So what do you think? How'd it go there, Echo? Good life stream? Oh, it went really good. Very good explanation and follow through with the uh, live stream. That went right. very well. Thank very you. easy to understand. Right on. Okay, here we go. We have, um, wow, the comments are going faster than I can read them. We got a ton. <laughs> Wow. Okay. 52, 80 reloaders out. Chuck Best is out. 47 Cavaliers out. Gates Jr. is out. Walter Bunny is out. Sergeant Sandman is out. Critter 9A is out. Harold Farmer is out. Six Shooter Texan is out. JH586 is out. Power Hunter is out. Andy 79Z28 is out. Bob Beans. Uh, Patriot Paul is out. Bisley Blackhawk is out. American Reloader is out. Reb uh, Tyree is out. Mike AO813 is out. We got a lot of guys on here that are new. Long Live Three is out. Uh, Patriot Paul, if you got to go, that's fine, buddy. Uh, Reloader Seven Six Two is out. Cesare Lafaro is out. Big Kenny's out. All right. And Patriot Paul. All right, folks. We'll be back in ten minutes. So we are out in three, two, one, and we'll see you in the giveaways. Hey, do you want me?